Hey folks, my name is Ibis Fernandez and uh, I've been an animator for well over 20 years now. I've been working with Flash for just as, about as much. But uh, what I'm gonna go over today is uh, I'm going to be demonstrating what I believe is the absolute groundwork, the base level, the foundation of what you need to learn uh, when it comes to Adobe Animate. And uh, if, if you're confused about what Animate versus Flash is, you know, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a controversy with, uh, you know, uh, Apple um, no longer supporting the Flash player. And that kind of cascaded into this whole uh, thing where uh, the technology itself, as far as how it relates to the web, uh, it's no longer supported. This doesn't mean that Flash is dead. Flash is still very much the household standard when it comes to animation uh, software for 2D animation. Uh, you can say what you want about uh, Toon Boom and uh, you know, um, uh, what are these other tools? Uh, cartoon Animator, Character Animator, uh, TV Paint, all these tools, uh, Toons. It doesn't matter at the end of the day Adobe Animate is the number one standard when it comes to uh, 2D animation software, modern 2D animation software. And uh, so I'm not gonna give you this whole spiel about history of Flash, where it comes from, who it's for, because if you are watching this video, uh, you pretty much already know what it is and you're interested in getting started. And what I'm gonna do for you today is I'm gonna give you that foundation. Uh, I'm going to go over what I believe is the most important parts of the software from a software operation standpoint uh, that anybody needs to learn and in the order you need to learn it. I'm going to try to get it all done in less than two hours uh, because this one is being done live. It might take a little longer, but it will be edited down for future distribution. So let's talk about Adobe Animate. Uh, let's uh, switch over here. Um, so. Adobe Animate has, uh, hasn't changed very much, to be honest, in the last 20 years. Uh, all the primary functions, all the general uh, usability areas are still pretty much exactly the same that they were 20 years ago. But um, you know, everybody who's just now getting, getting used to it, getting started with it, uh, and has questions, um, this is where we're going to start. And what I wanna talk about is the tools panel and the properties panel. Uh, Moho, yeah, that's right. Um, Lost Marbles Moho. Uh, that's a very complicated little product. I've used it many times myself. I tried it and uh, I always fail at it. Uh, and uh, once, I mean, in fact, in this video, in today's video, today's uh, stream, uh, you're gonna see me uh, go through certain things and you can compare that, you know, to your favorite 2D animation software, because like for example, when it comes to Moho versus Flash, um, it's so difficult just to make the most basic things. It's it's cre it's it's like it's created for uh, a more technical user. You know, uh, you have to pretty much uh, have an intention of how you're gonna approach a line. Whereas with Flash, it's more of a creative, uh, cre creative person's tool where you want to draw something, you just draw. You want to draw a circle, you want to draw a ball, you want to draw a frog, you just draw it. You're not going to be thinking about, you know, Bezier curves and, you know, like laying down shapes and, and layering stuff and, and, and all this technical thing, how you're going to do the line work uh, from a technical perspective, you just do it. So. Let's, uh, uh, I do have Flash open now. Uh, let's see here, and I'm gonna give myself a bigger view there. And I'm gonna create a new project here. And we'll get started with the actual uh, meat of the, uh, of the stream. See the content, the, the sizes itself, uh, it doesn't matter uh, what you start with. Uh, you can always pick whatever you want. Uh, Flash itself or Adobe Animate. You're gonna hear me use those terms interchangeably because ultimately Flash is Adobe Animate. Um, 
you can always change the resolution, the sizes, uh, the aspect ratio within the, 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 the document that you're working on. So it's, it's not that big of a deal what you choose uh, to start with. Um, so let's take a look at what the uh, tools panel and properties panel is. I'm going to reset my work area here. Um, <laughs> workspaces. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to this animator. No, let's switch to this basic one. Yeah, switching to this basic one gives us like the default view of when you first get Flash. This is kind of what it looks like. So what I'm going to recommend is you take this here thing on the left. This is your tools panel, and you detach it. And we're going to, for now, just kind of resize it a little bit to make it more reminiscent of the old flash. And I'm going to move it over to my right side because I'm right-handed. I can access those tools uh, directly a lot easier. And uh, so the reason I reset this is because I want to, I want to, I want to give you guys a nice uh, uh, basis, right, to, to start with. And I'm also going to pull up from the Windows menu the Properties panel. These uh, panels are <coughs> are two things that you're going to be dealing with. Almost everything that you do in Flash revolves around these two panels. I'm going to get rid of this alignment panel. This is a, a thing for a different day. The library, we're not going to be messing with that. We're just going to concern ourselves with the properties panel and the tools panel. So let's take a look at what the tools panel is, right? The tools panel contains all your general tools that you'll be working with. Okay, so first of all, we see a black arrow, which is also known as the selection tool. If you press and hold, you'll see a little sub uh, uh, menu that comes out when you see an additional tool there called the sub selection tool. All right, and I'm going to go over what these tools do in a second. So after that, we have the free transform tool. If you press and hold there, you see the gradient transform tool. And you can just kind of select which one you want. So you press and hold wherever you see this little uh, arrow on the corner. It means that there is a tool underneath that slot uh, aside from the one that's being displayed there. So here we have something called the lasso tool, right? I'm going to press and hold my mouse button on it and the little flyout menu comes out and I can see that I have an additional two tools in there, the polygonal tool and the magic wand. So by doing this, you are easily able to switch to multiple tools from within a single slot and you don't have to be uh, using up a lot of space. Uh, this brush tool, for example, this is the classic brush tool. And inside of that, we have the pencil tool. Uh, this pixel line tool, that's a custom tool that I, that, I, that I have that I use. That's not part of your standard set. We're going to ignore that. Um, but that, that, that's the first uh, step that I wanted to show you guys, that uh, some of these tools have uh, additional tools within each slot. And by holding down the mouse button as you press on top of that tool, rather than just clicking on it and switching to the tools, because you know you want to switch to the brush tool, you click on it, right? You want to switch to the selection tool, you click on that. But if you know you want to use the sub selection tool, you press and hold the mouse button on that tool that has the little arrow, and you select the new tool. Uh, same thing. If I want to grab the pencil tool, I'll press and hold my mouse on the brush tool there, and I can select the pencil tool. Now. The tools panel itself uh, in the newer versions of Flash, I'm working with uh, uh, version 2023 right now. Uh, you have this little three dots right here in the middle somewhere. This uh, three dots allow you to further customize it, okay? So you have additional tools that are not being placed out there. These tools, almost nobody really uses them, so they just kind of chunk them out there. But there are some people who do use them. So if there's a tool in here that you commonly uh, use, you can grab that tool. For example, this uh, camera tool or this bone tool, uh, the binding tool, and uh, a width tool. This is like a little line pumping mechanism uh, that allows you to adjust the, the width uh, of lines. 
uh, you can just grab a tool and just move it over to the uh, toolbar or the tools panel and place it in there and then you can close it out and now you have that tool easily available. So uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to take my pencil tool. I'm gonna, I like to move my brush tool here and this is a little reminiscent in the old flash where you have the brush next to the pencil. It makes it easy for me to click and grab my pencils. And you can customize the tools any way you like. I am gonna go over all the primary tools in a minute. Uh, right now, I just wanna show you how to customize the toolbar for your particular uh, way of working. Um, the selection tool, I kinda like all those selection tools together. Uh, I do use the eraser tool uh, fairly often. I'm gonna move that to the top. We have a rectangle and oval, uh, polystar, uh, all these other little things. I hardly ever use any of these except for the rectangle and circle, right? So I'm gonna take this oval tool, I'm gonna move it out here, and then I'm gonna move it back in. And I'm gonna take my rectangle tool, just put it at the front and just move it right there. Uh, so now I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting to get an idea of how my tools are being laid out for my own personal workflow. So here's my line tool. I'm going to move this a little bit to the top. And uh, uh, I don't ever use these. I'm just going to move them out of the way. And we will go over them uh, in a little while after after we go, we'll go over all the main ones. I'm just kind of making it a little bit more streamlined. All right, so I think we're gonna get started with that particular view, and then we're just gonna take, uh, uh, move it forward uh, from there. So, all right, so one of the things that you'll uh, see like almost immediately is these uh, color chips. And uh, one is referred to as the fill color chip, and the other one is the stroke color chip. This is gonna make a little bit more sense in a minute. Uh, next to that, you have a black and white button, which uh, whatever colors this is, it'll reset those to just black and white. All right, the, the little arrow up here on the upper corner just allows you to flip them, okay? And uh, we'll see how those come together in a second. So now, let's get started with the pencil tool. This is like one of the most basic tools that, that you can draw with, right? And one of the cool things about Flash that no other software has, okay, is that Flash, Adobe Animate, is really, really unnaturally natural when it comes to uh, an artist's uh, ability to draw. And by unnaturally natural, what I mean is, for example, this pencil tool, you know, if I want to draw a line, bam, I just draw it, right? But it goes a little bit above, uh, above and beyond just being uh, something that lets you draw lines, right? If I draw another line, see, here's the beauty of this thing. Flash or Adobe Animate, all, 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 it's already keeping track of your lines and how they interact with each other. So let's take a look at the selection tool. And this is one of the tools that you will be using more than anything uh, ever because this is your interactor. This is the, what you use to interact. And the selection tool is the black arrow. So by switching over to the selection tool, I can click on this line and notice that this whole section of the line became selected. Now, it stopped right here and this is because Flash detects that there's an intersection here and, and this is actually quite beautiful. Uh, if I select here, just that section becomes selected up to the intersection. All right. If I want to select the whole thing, if I want to tell uh, Adobe Anime to ignore the intersections, I have to double click the line. So I'm going to double click here, click, click, and the whole thing becomes selected. Now here's the other thing. Uh, the reason why the whole thing becomes selected is because it's also keeping track of the properties, the width and the color uh, and the type of line it is or the type of element that it is. So let's suppose that I have, now this, this outline color chip is for the pencil tool and the line tool and basically lines, okay? There's, there's, uh, there's two differences. There's a couple differences between what a line and a fill is and I'll explain that in a minute. There's so much to cover, I can't just throw it all out there. <laughs> so let's say I draw 
another line right here. That one's blue. I'm gonna draw these two red lines, right? I'm gonna zoom in. So, if I double click on this black outlines, now what you would expect based on what I showed you is that all of these lines are going to become selected. But, check this out. Remember what I said earlier. Adobe Animate is keeping track of each individual line's uh, properties. So when I double clicked, uh, it said go ahead and ignore the intersections and just select everything that has the same properties. So the red lines did not become selected and the blue lines did not become selected. Only the black intersecting lines did. All right. Now, maybe this is already uh, stirring up certain creative juices in your mind. I hope so because this is a very useful technique here uh, for just drawing in general. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I single click on this uh, line segment here, only that segment is going to become selected, right? Because there's an intersection there. If I double click, it's going to select everything that's connecting that contains the same properties, the same size, the same color, uh, and so on. But because that red line is different, it did not become selected. Now if I double click on this line, this whole thing becomes selected, but that one did not, even though it's the same color and everything else. Um, that's because they're not touching. So Flash recognizes this relationship between uh, the properties of an element and uh, how they interact with each other. That's, uh, that's something that no other tool uh, has been able to do. And I don't know if it's something that Macromedia patented or Adobe owns now, but it's definitely uh, something that software like Moho and Toon Boom and Toons and all these other software, they can't do it. They don't know how to do it. And this is such a beautiful little piece of uh, software innovation that just makes just working with this tool like just such a breeze, you know. So I'm um, press control A to select everything and I'm just going to delete. Now I'm gonna show you how I can interact with what I've shown you so far. I'm going to draw a, I'm just gonna draw a basic uh, series of shapes here. Circles. All right, so this is basically a cloud, right? So. I don't have to be precise, okay? Uh, 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 Tetsu, you mentioned that you work with Blender. Blender has the grease pencil. Whenever, whenever you draw with grease pencil, you know how you have to also be very uh, precise in how you draw everything. You can't just sketch things out because every line is its own independent object and doesn't interact. And to me, that's a pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when you draw in Flash or draw in Adobe Animate, you don't have to be precise, you just doodle, you know? Now that you know how, how the things interact, we're gonna take our selection tool, click that section here, delete, click this section here, delete. I'm going to delete this, delete that. I'm gonna go in here, in there. You know what, I'm just gonna select this entire region here and delete. I'm gonna select this here, delete. And now we're getting into another part of the selection tool. When I click and drag the selection tool, it allows me to draw a box around objects that I want to select. If I just select here, I only grab that section, right? So I'm exploiting that section of the selection tool. Just kind of cleaning up with the selection tool and the delete key, right? So now that I have that, I'm just going to click, delete, click, delete, click, delete, click, delete. And you don't have to be a, a super great artist. As long as you can doodle uh, and make some basic shapes, I mean, you can create really good artwork, you know? 
So there's a cartoon cloud. Just by laying out some some uh, uh, some doodles and cleaning it out, using that that feature in Adobe Animate that allows it to recognize uh, intersecting lines and their properties. So, what else can we do with this? <clears throat> I'm going to color it using the fill tool. So this fill tool. Also, also known as the, the bucket, the paint bucket, is associated with the fill color chip. So the, this, this red one here, this red color is the stroke color. And it allows me to control the color of the lines. The, uh, this big one here without the hole in the middle is the primary fill chip for the paint bucket, the, the paint fill chip. Uh, so here I'm going to grab a version of gray, actually, so that you guys can see. Uh, that's right. Easy cleanup. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to do like a dark gray uh, or semi-dark gray in terms of uh, what we're looking at because I want it to stand out on the screen. Uh, I'm, and I'm going to use the fill bucket and I'm just going to paint it in there. All right. So this fill tool works. Uh, I'm gonna be getting back to it uh, when uh, shortly once I get uh, down the list, but I want to introduce you to it. Okay, so the the fill tool works by allowing you to uh, select an item and just kind of click in the middle, click, 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 right? So, control undelete, uh, control delete, oh, yeah, undelete, undo, and. Uh, I'm going to double click on this line here. We're going to be using our, you know, what we've learned so far to delete. Double click this line to delete. Now, if I double click this red line, what's going to happen is that everything that's connected that is a red line will also become selected. So click, click, the whole thing becomes selected. If I change the color of that outline while an object is selected, that object is going to change into that color. Now, I'm going to show you what the fill color first and show you that nothing happens. That's because that's the fill color. So there's no fills currently selected, so that's not going to happen. But if I activate this, this, uh, the, the stroke color, as I change the colors, everything that's selected that is a stroke or that's a line also changes color. So that's one way to change all the colors at once. So I'm going to grab, make it a little bit darker line right there. So now I have a cloud, a gray cloud with a monochromatic outline. Let's take it a step further. We're going to exploit again our pencil tool to just roughly draw out using the color red, for example, because we just, we're not actually going to draw with it. We just need it as a guide. And and what I want to do is using this red outline, see, red outline, I'm going to just kind of draw areas where I want my shadows to be for this cloud, for example. All right. So, I'm going to also introduce you to the uh, eyedropper tool. The eyedropper tool uh, basically just allows you to select the color that's on the screen, right? So I'm gonna select this gray color here, and it cha it take uh, it takes the color that I selected. In this case, it was the gray color of a fill, so it updated the fill chip. If I were to put it next to an outline, you'll see the little icon, it changes to a little square, whereas when I put it over a fill, it changes into a solid. So it's actually got a little outline uh, rectangle thing. Uh, but uh, if, I, if I select the outline color, notice that the outline color here becomes uh, updated. So that's how you sample a color of a shape or a fill. Now. How am I going to exploit this now? 
uh, I'm gonna sample this color for the cloud and I'm gonna click on the color here I'm gonna open up this color wheel and I'm just gonna move it a couple notches on the uh, uh, see right here, right here we have hue which is this thing here saturation which is this thing here and uh, brightness uh, so I'm just gonna reduce the brightness a little bit All right, and I'm just gonna use the fill bucket to paint these areas. And notice how the fill bucket kind of stops and only paints the areas where the intersections are. All right, so now let's clean this up. How do we clean it up? What's an easy way to clean it up? <laughs> Anybody in the chat room, any ideas how we can just get rid of all of those red lines really quickly? <laughs> all right so we're gonna take our pencil tool we're gonna use the eyedropper tool to sample the color that we're using as our guide line now that we have that color we're gonna take our pencil tool and we're just gonna draw a big old mess boom 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 right so what happens now all of these lines are connecting to each other, all the red ones. So if we use our selection tool and double click on any of the red lines, <clears throat> they all become selected and all you have to do is press delete. Oh, look, we missed the spot. No big deal. All right. Easy peasy, huh? So now that we've done that, let's, uh, let's add a couple little highlights, all right? We're going to use that same red uh, color and we'll just kind of uh, use some fake uh, highlights here. And uh, this is definitely not what clouds look like as far as their shading, but you know, it'll give us the idea. We're going to do the same thing in reverse. Instead of making it darker, we're going to make it brighter. So we're going to sample the middle color, click there open the color wheel and we can adjust it from here or we can adjust it from here or we can use the actual values so I'm just gonna increase it a little bit this way just to make it brighter and we're gonna use the fill bucket to paint and we're gonna take our pencil tool which is already set to the red and we're just gonna make a line that connects these together we're going to use our selection tool to double click causes everything that's that same color to become selected and you could just delete not too shabby right select and delete yep <laughs> that's right you're a little too slow <laughs> but yeah all right so the pencil tool what happens next, uh, I'm gonna move this cloud over here. We may or may not use it. I have no idea where we're going with this. I'm just demonstrating the tools and the properties. Now, with the pencil tool, the next thing that we're gonna look at is properties, right? Anytime you do something in Adobe Animate, this properties panel becomes updated. It tells you what your stroke color is, information about how uh, the alpha channel, you know, how transparent it is, the size, the style of the stroke, uh, how wide or whether or not you want like a, like a different shape profile to this, to this thing, uh, scale, whether you want that line to scale itself uh, based on the document size, and I'll go a little bit deeper into that later. Uh, hinting, uh, hinting basically, um, ensures that the, your lines are drawn in places where the values have no decimal points so everything that you're drawing you're drawing on a grid uh, of x and y coordinates right and at any given point like an actual point might be like a you know 10 by you know 10 x by you know 200 y or whatever but it might be 200 point 97 y that point 97 the fact that it comes a little bit outside of the main pixel area it's going to cause it may cause your images to look blurry uh if you stick to um to 
keeping everything without decimal points, uh, you, you'll basically um, ensure that you have nice crispy graphics uh, when it comes to that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about anti-aliasing and aliasing and all that stuff uh, uh, as we go along in, in this uh, stream. Uh, but for now, let's take a look at the stroke size. So I'm going to change it to a number six a stroke. Oops. Okay. I'm going to change it to number 40. So if I go in here and I select, double click on one of these, even though these lines are red, only the line that is a, a value of one becomes selected. Now, it still respects the intersections, okay? But it doesn't respect the overall property. So if I were to double click here, only the lines that match those properties exactly are the ones that become selected. Um, once a, uh, an object is selected, you are able to change its properties the same way that we changed the color of it earlier. I can change the size to make it thicker or I can make it thinner. So if you're drawing, for example, if you're drawing uh, a happy face, right? And you decide, well, I don't like the, the shape of those lines. I'll make that a little bit thinner or thicker. So you have a little bit of control over that. And you're using that with the properties panel, right? And uh, you can change the, the, you know, the style of the lines. So if you want, if you want that, that dotted look, it's, it's more a little bit more obvious in the thinner lines. So you can draw like that. can do a little bit more sketchy type of uh, wiggly lines a little more more pencil-y type of line dotted all right so you get the idea now I can take these lines I want to hit control a to select everything Actually, I, don't, I didn't want to select that cloud. I'm just going to draw a box with the selection tool around these. And I'm going to change these. So notice that I'm, I'm changing the stroke size, but the style doesn't change. I'm going to change the style, and now the style changes to everything. Make it back solid. Or I can make it like a hairline, which is like a 0.1, super fine line. All right. So you saw me draw that that happy face, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm there. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that cloud because then we can always draw another one. Um, you saw me draw that happy face. I'm gonna do another one. nice and simple okay we want to clean something up we just select that and look i'm single clicking it the whole thing becomes selected that's because if we look closely there's a little gap right there so now we get into something fun you can if you hover your selection tool over a line See, there's a little gap right here. This one's a little bit more obvious. I'm gonna use that one as an example. So if you hover your mouse, your selection tool, over a line, shape, any kind of object, the little uh, cursor is always gonna change based on the context. In this case, you can see a little curve there. That means that you are able to bend that curve. It's kind of like working with putty. You're able to bend that curve and I can make those, those that, that curve line up here. Now I have an intersection which I can use to cut and piece that together, right? Same thing here. I can just kind of push it up a little bit. Now I can fill it in because now there's no gap. Now, there, 
well, we'll get into modifiers a little bit later, okay? Because there's other ways to approach that. Uh, <laughs> shiny cloud. <laughs> a very rubbery cloud made out of, like, uh, plastic balloons. Um, so let's take a look at this circle here, all right? Let's talk about modifiers. Every tool, almost every tool, has additional little tweaks they're called modifier, and, and they usually show up at the bottom of the tools panel. So if I'm going to click here, I can automatically see that the selection tool has two modifiers, a smoothen modifier and a straighten modifier. So how this works, we have this uh, line right here, right? I'm going to select it. I'm going to use the straighten modifier. Click, click. Click, 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 click. The more I click it, the more it straightens it out. So now it's a lot straighter. And this is a little bit more obvious if I would have done something like this. Boom. So it, it, it tries to remove the points as necessary in order to create uh, straight lines. Now, if I just keep doing this, eventually it'll straighten it up to a point where it just becomes a straight line uh, the other thing is the smooth modifier let me take this circle it attempts to smoothen out the shape without creating straight edges or keeps the straight edges very minimal okay so that's kind of a, another way of optimizing things now if we look at the pencil tool the pencil tool also has modifiers. This one is object drawing, and uh, I'm gonna leave that one for a little bit later. Uh, we have the straighten, smooth, and ink modifiers, okay? So the smooth modifier, I'm gonna make this a little bit thicker so you guys can get a better view. All right, so the smooth modifier attempts to recreate what I'm drawing but makes it a little bit smoother like I actually know what what I'm doing right <laughs> so I'm gonna draw and notice how it's slightly changed and it it basically if I was doing this on paper there's no way I could draw a, a line that smooth okay so so that's your smooth modifier then you have your ink modifier your ink modifier is I don't want your help Adobe animate I want to draw and I want you to recreate what I'm drawing exactly the way I'm drawing it so I'm gonna go here 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 all right and uh, this lines are a little thick I'll make it thinner so so you can see how more obvious it is so notice how Actually, I can select this one too and make it thinner. Notice how these lines are not exactly smooth. Okay, I'm going to zoom in on a section here. Notice all these little wiggly areas there. Okay, so if you want to ensure that your lines look exactly the way you're drawing them, use the ink modifier. So notice how you have these wiggly things. I'm going to go to this view menu here real quick. Turn off my grid. Let's see your view. Somewhere in here, view. Uh, I can't find it. Hmm. They moved it on me. I should be able to just turn off the, the little... Um, yeah. I should be able to just turn these uh, the, the little grid patterns off at the pixel level. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it too much though. Um, let's see here. So you can see that there are very jagged edges on this thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain why that's all relevant in a minute. 
okay? So notice how you have very, very jagged edges here. So depending on your, on your actual width, uh, it may not be as noticeable. Um, so let's see here, what else we have? And we have the straighten modifier. So the straighten modifier is uh, if I try to draw something, for example, like a box, it almost recreates it for me. I'm going to try with the mouse here. There you go. Perfect box. If I try to draw a line, it straightens it up into a line. If I try to do a curve like I did earlier, I get some uh, not so very interesting results. <coughs> so, now, knowing what we know so far, let's try to draw that happy face again. So I'm going to turn on this uh, pencil mode. I'm just going to draw with the mouse, okay? I'm just going to draw as best as I can a circle. Boom. I'm going to draw as best as I can another circle. Boom. As best as I can another circle. Boom. As best as I can another circle. Bam. Now, using our um, selection tool, we're going to grab these lines and just kind of tweak them out like, you know, like putty again. We're going to color it in. Let's say I don't want uh, outlines. One way to get rid of these outlines is again to select everything, double click, and delete. All right, let's, let's try a different method now. So I'm going to select everything. This time, I'm going to go into the stroke color uh, uh, swatches panel. And again, I can change the color to whatever I want. Also, in the properties panel, I can do the same thing here from the properties panel. But I can also make the lines thicker, okay? So the properties panel also allows you to do that kind of wacky stuff. Now what I want to do is I want to get rid of those lines uh, so without having to do all this because I might have lines that are red, I might have lines that are green and they're not all connecting and they are not all sharing the same properties so by double clicking here only the red one becomes selected by double clicking here only that blue one becomes selected. But if I do this, I select everything, and if I go in here, go into, oops, sorry, go in here, and I go to alpha, I'm oh, sorry, not alpha, if I go here, and you see this little uh, stroke thing, it just basically allows you to turn off the stroke, period. So I'm going to click on that, okay? It's very uh, unnoticeable, like, you, you, you wouldn't notice it, okay? So I got to make sure I select everything or everything that I want to get rid of. And I'm going to click that option. It doesn't even have like a little tooltip window, okay? But that basically just means no stroke. And I'm going to click it. Bam. Everything that is a stroke becomes deleted. So that's another way to clean up a drawing that's made up of different strokes that have different sizes, different colors, different shapes, different properties that that it's not as easy to do by using the double click method so let's say I do want to put an outline back in so where the paint bucket tool is you also have the ink bottle tool I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna click right here look at that it did something right but we don't see it because I'm using white so that's kind of my mistake uh, I'm gonna use green click there so I clicked here, which means that every outline that is touching this shape is going to get an outline. 
if I just click here on the edge, only that edge becomes uh, uh, created. So I'm gonna do that for this eye right here. Boom. Okay, so that would have also happened if I would have clicked in the middle. Because basically, when you click in the middle of an object or a shape, everything that touches that shape and has an outline is, is what takes on that outline. Boom. Boom. If I do it here in the middle, this one's gonna get an outline because it's touching. That one's gonna get one, that one's gonna get one, and that's gonna get an outline. Bam. Okay. Let's play around with the uh, the style. Change the stroke color. Change the width. So that's another interesting little shape, drawing, whatever you know you can do with some of these basic tools. <coughs> All right, what else can we do with this? What else do I want to do with it? I can click a shape; it becomes selected. Every other object or shape that's touching this shape, if I double click on it, click click. Oh shit. I guess they changed that. It doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> it did it here. So I'm going to do this one. This whole thing becomes selected. I don't know why it's not doing it here. Weird. This should also become selected. So I don't know if this is a bug uh, and animate, but you can see that if I do it on this big shape here, everything that's touching that shape becomes selected. So likewise, because I'm doing it here, this one and this one should have also become selected. Uh, it's not doing it in this case, and uh, I don't know why. Uh, it used to be able to, but uh, it doesn't matter. So there's keyboard modifiers, and your keyboard modifiers are like your Shift, Alt, and uh, Control. I'm going to show you how those work. Back to the pencil tool. Let's say that I draw a shape like this. Ooh, that's kind of funky, right? Um, I'm going to double click it. I'm going to change the size to maybe a number three. I'm going to change it back to a solid. All right, that's much better. Um, we, we know about the, uh, uh, the basic um, uh, the basic ability to just kind of move things around like this, right? But there's also keyboard modifiers. For example, if I hold down um, Alt and I drag, notice what happened. Instead of grabbing this line and just kind of pulling the whole thing with sort of like a, a weight system, um, it actually just grabs a point. And that's actually what it's doing. It's adding a point here and allowing me to drag out. All right. So another thing is you saw how if I, with the selection tool, I hover my mouse over an edge uh, in the, on the inside, I can bend the line if I hover my mouse at a corner, you see how it's no longer a little curve right there and the little icon? I can grab that point and move it. Same thing with an edge because that's basically an end point. So I can go here, just kind of do something like that. Now Adobe Animate recognizes when things are either close to each other or they're touching each other, they're interacting with each other. So it's going to try to work with you. <laughs> Like a fuzzy tennis ball. 
Yeah, that did kind of look like a fuzzy tin as well. So let's uh, let's draw another basic shape. Double click that to delete it. So let's see. I'm going to start with just the basic line, and this is the line tool. Okay, line tool just draws lines, straight lines. Sometimes when you want to draw something, uh, just a regular line is is good enough to start with. So let's uh, let's see. Let, I'm going to draw a line that goes here, and I'm going to draw a line that goes there. But notice that as I hover my mouse over this edge, it's going to know, it's going to know, it's going to basically know that I'm trying to grab that from, from there. So it connects them. So it automatically connects those two lines together, right? If I go back to my selection tool, I can bend this like that. If I grab another line from here to here, I can also bend like this. Or I can use my keyboard modifier. That's the Alt key on the keyboard. The Alt key is going to allow me to put another point right there. And by dragging, it brings it out this way. So now let's let's tweak this out. I'm drawing this completely with the mouse. I'm not do, using any fancy tools. Um, I'm gonna use the sub selection tool. So by clicking on the sub selection tool and then clicking an object, it allows me to see what's underneath. And we can see that this shape is composed of one, two, three, four points. And those points have curves in the middle. So you can have additional control over your curves and points by switching to the the sub selection tool so you have your selection tool that allows you to work with the general shapes in the general manner but the sub selection tool allows you to work with what's basically under the hood so if i if, now that i've selected this shape i can see where the points are if i click the actual point you can see the, this little handles uh, pop up. And that allows me to just kind of tweak the curvature of those, uh, of those lines. So I can make more advanced curves without adding additional data. See, the thing between, uh, for example, that a lot of people don't take into account is that vector graphics are not, um, for lack of a better word, bit mapped. <laughs> uh, where, where you have raster based uh, graphics, every bit in that graphic has been mapped. That's why I usually call it a bit map. Uh, because it's there it's set in place it's basically been put on the board it is what it is uh, this pixel is red it has this amount of brightness to it the pixel next to it is blue it has this amount of brightness we it, it knows what it is that way when you enlarge that image you still have that that pixel that's the same size it's been set in stone and that's why when you enlarge a, a graphic like that you always end up looking at the pixelated images but a vector graphic is not a real graphic. Uh, under the hood, it's just a mathematical calculation. And it's a mathematical calculation that's being processed by your computer. Uh, in my case, about 24 frames per second. Uh, it depends on how, how you have your system running. You can have it running at 120 frames per second. But every frame that goes by, the system is rendering that mathematical calculations at however many frames per second you have it set up. This is why if I zoom in, that graphic is gonna look, hang on a second. That graphic looks perfectly sharp because at the end of the day, under the hood, that calculation that's being utilized to draw that shape it's still the same calculation. It's 
from this point to this point there is uh, two points with a curve that goes this way in this trajectory whatever um, so that calculation is always going to be like that it's not mapped uh, it's all dynamic and that is why vector graphics always look sharp and beautiful and clean uh, it's only when you convert them to bitmaps and you zoom in then you can see the degradation so <clears throat> uh, let's get off of that rant uh, we can see that this object or this shape is composed of one two three four points and several curves in between I'm going to um, next to it I'm going to draw a similar shape using the pencil tool I didn't draw with the lines because when I placed it with the lines I made sure I mean a line is just two points with a thing in the middle right it's it's basically point point boom I have a line so now I'm gonna draw with my pencil tool I'm gonna try to approximate that same shape that I just did I mean it's it's good enough it looks clean it looks clear but if I go with my subselection tool and click on it, this shape is significantly more complex. So it takes more points and more curves to draw this shape than it did to draw this one. I mean, I literally drew this one with like four lines, you know. Uh, this is a lot more complicated, which means that um, depending on how much or how complicated your artwork is, the more you draw, the more processing power you're going to need to be able to render it because your system has to render all this stuff in real time over and over and over. And you have like, you know, a million points and, and curves on the screen and you're trying to render all of those things in real time, 24, 60 frames per second. The system's going to choke. You're going to lose frames. It's going to very, look very choppy. Uh, and a lot of people just don't understand that okay so always think of it uh, under the hood vector graphics is really just a series of plotted mathematical calculations that are playing in real time the sub selection tool allows us to edit this okay so I can come in here and I can click that point and I can delete it click on that one and delete it and I can, you know, clean up a drawing and get rid of as many unnecessary points as I want. And I can tweak my shapes to still make them match and maintain the original uh, uh, thing, but without increasing the actual complexity of it. Uh, a point can be adjusted using the arrow keys on your keyboard. So here I'm going to press down a couple times to the right, up. So you can tweak pixel by pixel where these points are located using the arrow keys. So let's get rid of that one right there. Delete. We'll adjust that curve right there. Okay, so it's still significantly more complex, and if I was really, really like super detail oriented, I could go in here and literally clean up this shape. So I could also do it uh, with, uh, you know, with as little as two points. I mean, you can. I mean, this is you can you can significantly optimize a shape. Uh, something like this, you can probably do it with just two points. To be honest, let's see, one, two. We add a curve here, oops, with the regular selection tool. We can add a curve here, a curve there. We'll connect these two together. So, so far we have one, two, three. We're going to bring this to the middle. We still have just two points. But now we, we screw around with the with the curves. So that becomes a little complicated now because it wants to do that number there. So maybe I maybe you can't do it with two points, but you get very close. So 
So if you were trying to like go for the world record of optimization, <laughs> this will probably be <coughs> one hell of a, a challenge here. So this entire shape is using just two points and maybe three or four curves in there. You know, I can add. Oops. I can add points here. I'll have to have the selection tool turned on. And just continue to edit. So I have this weird curve looking thing here. I'm going to click on it. And with the modifiers for the sub selection tool, I'm just going to smoothen it out. There we go. I'm going to smoothen out this also. What's happening in with the smoothening tool, if I'll show you now that you know about the sub selection tool. So you have this curve is one, two, three, four, five, six points, right? So if I select that, I click it a couple times, it's, it's trying to maintain that shape by rearranging the points. Uh, sometimes it adds, sometimes it removes, but here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's seven points, it smoothened out the curves and everything. Uh, sometimes it removes points. Um, I can delete a point right there. And I can adjust the curve. And I can continue working. <coughs> yeah, I mean, there's really no um, substitute for vector art, especially for cartoon animation, you know. it's uh, You're always going to get, like, super clean. And we're looking at future forward technology, you know. We, we got stuff that was animated in the year 1999 using flash 3 i can export that stuff in 4k like today so i was working on twin on stuff 20 years ago that is still going to look beautiful in a modern day television because i can go to the original source export it out in 4k 8k whatever you know whatever resolution we have 10 20 years from now this is going to ensure that our, our our product, whatever we're building, especially if we're building something that we consider to be timeless, uh, it's always going to look beautiful and crisp. You know, once you have a higher resolution monitor or whatever, your graphics take a hit. Uh, you know, your raster graphics. Uh, now, now you start talking about restoration and upscaling and all that stuff, and uh, vector graphics just don't have that issue. And uh, and this is like. A lot of this stuff is very specific to Adobe Anime too, like the inter interactions between the, the properties of the lines and uh, the colors and stuff. You're not gonna find that in Moho. You're not gonna find that in Toon Boom. You know, it's uh, it, it it it's. I call it an unnatural natural process because we're not used to drawing with things that intersect. You know, to, in order to create art, but the fact that it's there means that it feels like a very natural workflow even though it's not a natural process you know i'm just drawing with the line tool you know that was very easy to do You know, the, you know, drawing, that was just the line tool. I'm just using the mouse. It, it doesn't require a lot of special stuff. Once you know how to uh, operate these tools and what they do and how they interact, you can really do a lot, of, a, a, a lot of really good artwork with very minimal effort and without like fancy tools, really. I mean, I have this graphics tablet here because, you know, I, it, why not? You know, it makes everything easier, but 
when I started, I didn't have anything. You know, I was basically you draw with the mouse and we made it work. And this tool allowed us to do it and it's still perfectly functional. So here I am, I'm just drawing with the mouse, playing around with shapes. Okay. Um, we already explored the, the, the fill tool. I'm gonna paint that little arrow in that heart. Just gonna grab me a different value there. Fill that in. And I will go for a darker version of that one. And what we learned earlier, we just grab a similar line that matches the other lines, connect them, and delete. And you know, that's very modern-ish type of artwork. A lot of uh, flat 2D icons and stuff are, you, are, are, are utilized, uh, are, are created using a similar technique, okay? Let's uh, try some more tools. <coughs> <coughs> and I'm leaving this properties panel here because you notice that every time I'm working with something, that properties tool is changing so here I'm working with a line it's telling me that I have the line tool on and the, the stroke is red it's a 100% I can change the opacity of it to 50% maybe boom 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 I can make a very lightweight <clears throat> I'll leave it at 3% you can barely see it Okay. Now, one, the other modifier that uh, that the pencil tool has, and the brush tool has it too. Uh, let's see here. But we haven't gotten to the brush tool, so I'm not going to mess with that yet. Is okay. So we talked about the straighten, smooth, and ink. I'm going to go back to smooth because this is what, if you draw with this pencil tool, this is what you will typically be working with. Like that and uh, having a, a transparency on that it's kind of nice sometimes especially if you're using it for for rough drafting ideas that you're gonna go ink over them uh, later on and I'll show you an example of that later um, oh I can select this thing here and now that I have something selected since I have two colors I can just switch out between the blue and the red. So that's another thing that those chips do since I have an object selected. So anyways, I talked about that pencil tools, modifiers, uh, straight and smooth and ink. Now let's talk about this uh, object drawing mode. By selecting this, when I draw with it, what I drew basically got grouped into what uh, Adobe Anime calls an object. Now this is an independent object. It is not going to interact with this line. So even the, the lines themselves are composed of the same um, of the same um, uh, properties on the outline. They're both red. They're both uh, size three. Uh, they both have the same smoothing and all that stuff. Uh, they're treated differently because this one is its own independent object. So <clears throat> when you have that one turned on, you can do stuff like this. All right. So from an outsider's perspective, that's just a line. But, and I mean, I can still manipulate it like a typical line.
But if I click on it, the whole thing becomes selected. Or if I click and drag on it like that, I mean, I can, I can manipulate it. But if I click and drag, it, it just selects the entire object, right? So this object is, it's like a little, it's like it's been grouped into its own little shape that is independent. Um, because it's an object, while it was selected, I just changed the fill and it automatically changed for me. If it's not selected, can select another color and I can still change its properties but look at this so on the surface I can see that and this is how most objects uh, in Moho and Toon Boom and stuff like that this is the only thing that they can do everything is an independent object it's like in blender the grease pencil every line that you do it's an independent object but it doesn't have that interactivity thing that thing that makes it a more enjoyable method of working <clears throat> so let's see here I cannot even though everything in my bones tells me that I should be able to fill this in with a color I'm not able to do it that's because that those things are not actually intersecting there's a those are different objects and they're just kind of stacked on top of each other. They're layered. And they have their own usefulness. Um, for example, I'm going to draw a self-shaded ball. I'm going to turn that off. I'm just going to do a basic ball. And let's say I want to color this ball in. And typically, in order to perform the cell shading, I would come in here and I would, you know, select that independently, right? But what if it's a complex shape? Uh, so objects are independent objects, right? They're independent things. They don't, they don't interact with the, uh, the objects that have been laid down. Uh, so I can't just come in here and uh, paint because the whole thing becomes... Um, it's, it, there, there's no intersection but by creating an object I'm able to manipulate it independently until I have the right shape of how I want this thing to, to go down and if I select it I can break it apart by pressing control B and that turns it into its, uh, 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 a regular shape like everything else so now it is intersecting with the different lines and stuff. So let's go back to another uh, quick drawing. And uh, this is going to be done using this uh, oval tool. The oval tool draws uh, ovals. If I hold down the shift key, I can draw perfect circles. Same thing with the uh, rectangle tool. I can draw perfect squares by holding down shift. Or I could just draw and just create independent objects, right? I'm going to turn off the object drawing mode and I'm going to draw a bunch of circles. And uh, using the properties panel, I'm going to disable the fill. So when I draw, I could draw just circles without any fill. Uh, the stroke, I'm just going to make like a dark gray. And I'm just going to put down a bunch of circles like this. Same thing I did earlier. I can use the eraser tool to just kind of go in here. Oh, that's too small. Using the properties panel, I'm going to adjust the size of that. It just kind of get rid of some of the interior lines using the selection tool I'm going to click the the parts that are still kind of out there and 
and now have a nice fluffy little cloud. I'm going to draw with the square tool. Again, I can disable the, excuse me, I can disable the fill. So I'm only drawing using outlines. And I'm going to use my line tool to just kind of connect these points together. Like that. And I'll use my selection tool to just kind of clean out the sections that I don't want. I can use my paint bucket. to fill in the colors that I want. Use the color picker off the fill chip to choose a different color. I can select this outline, everything that's interconnected that matches the same properties. If I double click, becomes selected and I can delete. So now I have a little bit more of a three dimensional box without the outline. Um, let's draw like a taller one so I'm going to select a different color here You create all sorts of like interesting uh, shapes just with the oval tool, the rectangle tool, and uh, you know manipulating the line tool and the uh, selection tools and stuff. Let's uh, talk about some additional properties. Uh, welcome back, Tetsu. I'm gonna draw. Again, with the properties, I can control uh, different properties of my tool. So again, with the fill, I'm gonna make it so that I'm using no fill. I'm going to select this, and now I'm gonna introduce you to the transform tool. So the transform is, I can do stuff like that. If I hold down the shift key, when I'm dragging, I can do stuff like this. If I hold down the Alt key, I do stuff like that. You'll notice this little dot in the middle. This dot is known as the uh, transformation point. So everything that I do is based around this point. So if I move the point here, my transformations happen from that point. If I move it here, it happens from that area there. If I move it here and I try to rotate, it'll rotate around that spot right there. So let's say I want to draw, actually, you know what, I have a, Good idea for a drawing, a simple drawing. With the line tool, I'm going to draw some kind of diamond looking shape. And I'm going to go ahead and fill it in with a color. Actually, you know what? Let's 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 make it a little bit more dynamic. I'm going to double click this, press control D to duplicate, okay? And we do that. Shift and the arrow keys will allow me to do stuff like this, move it around. If I just use the arrow keys, it moves smaller amounts. I can use my line tool to just create little connections there. With the selection tool, I'm exploiting Adobe Animate's ability to recognize its intersections to clean that up. I'm going to 
paint this section with one color. I'm going to go in here and make this a little bit darker. And I'm going to choose a different version of this color, a different tone for this panel here, for this side. And I'll go ahead and get rid of this outlines. You know what? I'm going to make those outlines the same color, but darker. By switching them using that tool that we saw earlier, just making it darker. Now we have a monochromatic outline, so a little bit more professional, cartoony looking, uh, looking feel. And maybe make those uh, that outline a little thinner. Let's do a, a thickness of one. So now we have something that looks like that. So if I if I grab this, I, I take my registration point or my transformation point. I'm going to move it down here. So now I'm able to do stuff like that, right? I'll rotate it along that section. If I hold down my shift key while I'm rotating, it kind of locks it into like, I think it's a 15 degree increments. I'm going to move that registration point or a transformation point a little bit more down there. I'm going to hold down the alt key. on the shift key like that I'm press control D to duplicate shift up shift left just kind of put it back in the same spot notice that that reg that transformation point hasn't changed hold down the shift key and just move it down duplicate again do that I'm going to switch to 100%. I'm not moving the location of that transformation point. I'm going to duplicate Control D. And I'm just going to keep doing it a couple more times. I'm going to do one more. So now we have a very, very interesting shape by duplicating and adjusting that red, that transformation point. All right, let's try a different drawing. I'm going to do use the rectangle tool without a fill, disable it. And I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to go ahead and just connect these together using the line tool. Control A to select everything. Now with the transformation point, I'm going to move it to the middle here section and then just going to angle it a little bit. I'm going, get, I'm going to use that selection point to get rid of some areas that I don't want. And with the fill bucket, we do have uh, a, a different uh, type of uh, coloring system that we can uh, exploit. Um, let me see here. Yeah, there's one here, but there's also under window, I uh, believe it's color. We can switch to a gradient color and we'll go into gradient colors uh, uh, in, the, in, in greater detail a little bit later. But I'm going to select that color there and I'm going to bring it in, push it out that way and make it darker. So 
So I have a gradient that goes from light to dark. Make it a little bit more obvious that it's darker. I'm going to paint with that just like that. All right, so what I'm getting at here is I'm trying to make sort of a, a, a three-dimensional uh, sheet of glass, okay? With the line tool again, and we covered over, we, we did cover the object drawing mode. So I'm gonna turn that on. And this object drawing mode, it's its own independent object. It doesn't interact with the rest of the drawing. If I double click on that object, it goes inside of that object and I can draw more elements in there. Okay, I can draw with the straight up with the box. If I want to save myself some time, I just use the selection tool to just kind of tweak the locations. I just kind of select the inside of that. get blank or I can continue doing hang on, make sure all of these are independent outlines and not objects all right objects can be nested inside of each other And colors can, in fact, be transparent. So I'm going to take this white color here. I'm going to give it a transparency of maybe 40-ish percent. So notice this thing is not, it's not filling in the gaps. So a modifier for the paint bucket is the, uh, the gap size. So right now, I have it set to don't close gaps. And the reason it worked here is because there's no open gaps, but somewhere in here, those lines are not touching, so it doesn't allow me to fill them in. I'm gonna select close small gaps, still not working. I'm gonna switch to close large gaps. It's still not working. Hmm. Let me see. Okay, that's because there's some lines there that are objects. I'm gonna break that apart. And now I'm gonna try filling it in. There we go. I'm going to use that previous method to get rid of the outlines where I go in here and just kind of tell it to turn it off. So now I end up with just two very transparent overlays. Yeah, you can do so much just with the line tool. Um, one of my favorite methods uh, uh, to vectorize objects is if, if I'm drawing something on paper and pencil and I scan it in and bring it into Flash, I just go with the outline tool and just bend the outlines around the, 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 the object that I draw that I'm trying to trace. And uh, I can get some really good vectorization done that way. Excuse me. So, properties panel. Here I'm going to change the color of the stage size. Just so we can see what we're doing a little bit better. Now we can see that I just made myself a nice little sheet of glass because of that transparency of course i can adjust the transparency of this color even more if i'm not happy with it double click probably have to go in make it less transparent a little bit more shiny 
or if you really want to be fancy you can go back to the color panel and uh, we'll choose a gradient again linear gradient we'll just choose two versions of white double click that little swatch there from white to white but one of those whites is going to be very transparent and I'm gonna fill it in by clicking and holding it and that gives me a little bit more of a glassy feel to it It's just like a little sheet of glass. If I'm drawing an object like, um, so yeah, let, let's, let's now talk about the brush tool. The brush tool basically allows you to draw with complete shapes as you create a stroke. So, if I turn on, if I go back to my properties panel, I'm going to adjust the size of my brush, uh, size 10. And uh, <clears throat> right now it's using my, um, my, my, my graphics tablet um, as pressure sensitivity for it. For, I, I just turned it off right now, but I can turn it back on and it'll be based on the amount of pressure that I put in. All right, don't get caught up in that. So here's the difference between the pencil tool and the brush tool. Here's my pencil. It's a single line. It's two points with, uh, or several points with the pencil tool with a curve defined in the middle. A brush stroke is actually an outline shape all the way around with a fill in the middle. So if we go to our sub selection tool, we'll take a look at that first line. We can see it's just a bunch of little dots there, the Belgier points and curves. But if we select this one, we can see that it's really just an outline all the way around with a fill in the middle. And that's how it's representing a brush stroke. So I could, again, with the line tool, if I wanted to do a fancy brush stroke by hand, I could just do the outline using the, the line tool, create a gesture between the different points and that's basically what a brush uh, stroke is I guys I just got to fill it in now and let's see that's the problem every line that I drew was an independent object so I'm gonna break this apart because I don't like drawing that way. <laughs> but uh, when you draw, you gotta make sure, you, if you wanna draw more natural, just turn off object drawing. I mean, it has its place, but it's not always ideal. Uh, but I can fill it in now, if I can get rid of these outlines. So I, ha I end up with what's essentially a brush stroke, but I drew it with the out outlines. let's see here so let's get into a little bit more of a so i'm going to draw like an apple i uh, accidentally drew a little dot in there let's make this smaller All right, we have an apple. So this apple was drawn using the brush tool. 
and it's composed of a lot of different points. Okay? So it requires a lot of the little points and stuff to create the gesture of that of that of of that outline even though it's not really an outline, well, from from an art perspective it is. But from a technical perspective, it's not I can draw this outline like this, my selection tool, and this is just me drawing with the mouse. grab a little bit of a darker version of this red <clears throat> with the fill tool make it a little bit even darker there and we'll use the oval tool here to get a lighter version of that red Maybe a little lighter. So I that one I did it with the um, with just the line tool. Okay. Now with the pencil tool. <laughs> It does make for easier shading. It definitely does. You know, once you start learning what each tool does, uh, you can start, uh, you, you can really exploit it. That This is why I feel like if you can figure out, you can learn what each one of those tools does and how they interact with each other and its relation to the properties panel, everything else that you do in Adobe Animate, it's, it just makes more sense. It's easier. You'll have a better, more creative approach to how you do things. So now I'm going to draw with just the pencil tool. I'm going to draw an apple. And again, I'm drawing with the pencil tool. I, 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 don't need to, I, need, I don't need to worry about being perfect because I know that I'm going to be able to exploit that, that, um, that thing that Adobe Animate has where it recognizes the uh, intersections. So I could just clean that up. Look at that. It's an organic apple, so it's a little bit jacked up. <laughs> That's my excuse. It's an organic apple. So there's an apple. Really weird looking apple. Um, I can take this line. And using the properties tool, just that outer line, using the properties tool, I'm going to adjust the stroke size maybe to a three. You know what? Let's do it for this one also. Let's make these our number two. Okay. So when I look at this with the sub selection tool, I can see that you know they're individual lines, whereas this one is just the outlines alone is about twice the number of points that there is in here. But the problem is that by by default, it's just a solid line. Um, if you don't have a graphics tablet, you don't have fancy equipment, you can select an outline. And go to modify shape convert lines to fills so basically this is going to take that line that thickness and whatever it is that's containing that and it's going to transform it into something that's like this so convert lines to fills it essentially looks the same right nothing has changed but now if we select it 
with the sub selection tool we can see that it's basically doubled up on the amount of points in order to create that this of course gives us another superpower just with the selection tool now I can come in here and I could just kind of tweak little sections of it okay I can introduce those little uh, pressure sensitivity artifacts or whatever you want to call that the weights I can't do it with this one because this one's a regular outline but I can do it with this one because that's like a complete shape really now over here we have some kind of like a very special situation so we have like a nice little crazy cluster of points in there and we can individually select those to just kind of smoothen it out just click the points and delete them or or we can use our selection tool just that section there and modify it you know smoothen it smoothen it smoothen it boom that's another trick that you can do so if I take a pencil stroke and it's all jacked up select it I can smoothen it before the fact or I can smoothen it after the fact right double click modify shape convert line to fill so now that I have that I can come in here and manually adjust and tweak like line widths for this new outline get all nice and creative with it or I could just select the whole thing and just do smoothen a couple times and it'll randomly add those weights to it so I do end up with like a cute little outline that looks like I, I actually did it with a pressure sensitive graphics tablet so I could I, you know if I if you have access to a graphics tablet you could do something similar by drawing that, that way and even then you can also further optimize that one using the smooth modifier okay let's see what else we have um, now here is one that almost every vector drawing tool has the pen tool so the pen tool allows you to just click and drag dragging allows you to just kind of immediately project your trajectory so now this thing is going to be curving that way so when I click my next point it goes like that when I click my next point it goes like that and then my next point if I go up or down and that's how it's going to draw so this is a this is a little bit more for the technical folks who enjoy working with a more technical uh, way of drawing so that's your pen tool you can further tweak it with the sub selection tool the cool thing about that is that you're almost always drawing clean artwork you know that you know it, it does it's not cluttered with too much too much data okay that should be enough of that let's see uh, this handy trick for when I don't feel like breaking out the tablet <laughs> that's right uh, sometimes that can be me <laughs> yeah yeah I, I bet uh, 
even now that I do have access to like a fancy graphics tablet, I still find myself working with the basic tools, you know. Uh, one of the most useful tools is the line tool. I mean, the line tool can be used for almost anything, you know. And, you know, you just kind of start laying it out and, and you just start molding your lines. You know, uh, now you go with the selection tool, you add points to it, and then you just work from there. It, it's 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 very easy once you get the hang of it and it's not that hard to get the hang of it it's just a matter of being exposed to it you know the the processes a lot of people i mean they they, they and it's understandable, you know, we're all artists and we just want to draw and animate. And uh, you you just basically expect for it to be an art program. But really what you have to consider is that it's, it's, it's more of a technical workflow, like cleverly masquerading as an art tool. Okay, so we'll go back to the color panel we'll go with the linear gradient again we'll select that one and we'll make it completely dark and a little darker we're going to introduce some black And with this bucket, um, yeah, with the bucket tool, you click and you hold into the direction that you want to go. Um, let's see here. Oh, I was accidentally doing the, the pencil. We'll just switch them over again. You click and you drag in the direction that you want to go. So let's say I want my shadow to be like right here. I want it to gradually work its way up. You just kind of click in the direction that you want the gradient to be. Okay, if you're not getting the gradients exactly the way you want, here's the next tool. This is the gradient transform tool. By selecting this, it works like the transform tool, but it's for gradients, okay? This allows you to adjust how the gradient operates inside of the shape. You can do some very, very advanced uh, drawings with these gradient uh, tools uh, with just the way that you do your gradients I'm gonna get rid of that outline so now we have something that looks like that I mean that can lead to some very very advanced uh, artwork once you once you can see how that works let's see here let's say that I am drawing a character uh, properties panel make sure I'm, I'm gonna use my brush size of two and I'm gonna use a black color so let's see here I'm gonna turn on pressure sensitivity it's not doing it why is it not doing it Do a three. Okay. So 
So let's say if I'm drawing just a, a character. This is going to be off screen, so I'm not worried about what that looks like. I'm going to fill that in with a flesh tone of some kind. All right, so you know that section right there. And actually, let me erase this part so it's not distracting us. All right, so you know, like, um, well, for one, we can take this outline and smoothen it out, and clean it up a little bit. Just press that a couple times. Click, click, click. That gives us a little bit of variety in our line work that we could just come in here and tweak. So that automatically improves our artwork like a hundred times. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to show is like for example you see this uh, eye socket area here so like like a little good trick that I do and you can make like subtle it's such a subtle little effect but it adds so much to it so I'll go back to my window uh, color I'm going to switch to a linear gradient. Grab that color there. Grab it again, but this time I'm going to make it a little bit darker. And I'm just gonna paint with it right there. Sometimes it doesn't matter how you lay it out because we can always use our gradient transform tool to adjust it. We're gonna put the shadow part at the top and we're just gonna gra uh, just slowly gra graduate to, uh, to the base color there. And it just kind of gives us a, like a nice little eye socket that we can draw on top of for our main um, eye portion. Let's see here, paint normal. And again, don't always worry uh, too much when you're laying down artwork because the tools can be modified. Right there, I'm going to use that smoothing modifier and just kind of tweak the way that looks and see how it already smoothened out my line work quite significantly. All right, I'm going to use my pencil tool right here and just create like a basic cell shade by selecting that color and just gradually making it a little bit darker. Ooh, look at that. It just kind of went through. So there's either a gap right here, right here, or right here. We don't want that. We're gonna turn on our modifier, close small gaps, boom. So wherever that gap was, it's, it's detecting it and it's uh, ignoring it. Okay, so there's all sorts of things that you can do once you start mixing and matching the way that these uh, uh, 
these tools interact you know you can do more and more and more so let's see we've got the selection tool we've covered the sub selection tool we've covered the free transform tool yeah to a certain extent so the free transform tool has some modifiers that we didn't cover and they're always going to be down here free transform and you got skew and rotate of course this is uh the the, the this stuff is always there you know uh, even without it by holding down the shift key or the alt key you can you can use the same tool without having to click on this this is just a way of, of not doing that scale rotate uh distort uh, the sort also you do it with the alt key but you can do it through by by pressing that that modifier there so if you want to have like a little bit more perspective or whatever uh, you can distort the image now a really cool one the one that I personally use a lot is this one and this one's not available through a keyboard shortcut uh, this one is the envelope tool and you can manipulate a drawing based on an envelope So you can further tweak whatever you're drawing to make it match a little bit more like the way that you want, the way that it's in your head. Okay. Um, let's see, there is another tool here that is not that common this is the acid warp tool i'm going to bring that one out okay this is a lot of people don't use this and i don't use it that uh, that often either but it's, it's a very nice little tool once you get this tool it's going to have this little pin icon you click on that and you place a point on your shape all right now you put you know you're going to put another one there another one here another one there wherever you want it it doesn't matter it's kind of like creating like adding bones to a mesh so now let's see here it, it, it's kind of created like its own little object thing so I can manipulate this object like this it's almost like warping it using some kind of bone system and you can take this shape and, you, and when you, I mean you can break it apart by pressing control B and it turns it back into a like a, something that you can work with Um, I'm gonna delete that. Uh, it's not a very common tool, so I, I don't typically work with it. Uh, of course, your hand tool allows you to just kind of move your your stage around. So I guess I should draw something on the stage so it's more obvious. So this is one that I don't use from the from the uh, tools panel often, but for some reason I always keep it there. I guess it's force of habit. But if you're like on the uh, selection tool, for example, if you just hold down the space bar on your keyboard, it automatically allows you to do that too by clicking and dragging your stage around. Um, let's see here. The fluid brush tool is one of the newer brush tools. And it's kind of a weird tool. Uh, it works almost exactly the same, but... Um, Let's see here. I'll make it bigger so you can kind of see it. It has additional like features like like the stabilization, curve smoothing, uh, roundness, how, how round it should be. So like see how like you have something that looks like that, the angle. So it it it, it can be a little handy. It gives you a little bit more um, options on your brush. I personally still prefer the traditional brush tool. 
taper. Look at this. So this is something that a lot of people may like. Also, one of the benefits of this one is that it doesn't break. When you're working with the, uh, with the regular brush tool, if you let go of it, sometimes it'll break. Or even, or if your thing is too sharp, sometimes it'll break that that line, and you'll be required to do. Uh, it's making a liar out of me because it's not breaking it. <laughs> but sometimes it'll break, and you'll be required to just kind of go over it again or redo it. But that fluid brush, it it it, it it's it's a little bit of a I don't know. It's kind of new. It it feels nice. It's. Um, it's it's, it's kind of weird though. I I, I I I haven't gotten used to working with that yet. But you do have different uh, options that the regular brush tool doesn't have. So this is more of a you know it has a different it it just has a totally different feel to it. But at the end of the day, it's the same type of a uh, brush stroke. If I select it with the sub selection tool, it still kind of does that. So it, it, it's a it's a very different type of brush. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, some people might prefer that. The paint brush tool. This is the the new one. This is the replacement one. It's kind of I don't know. I don't like it. It draws using like a pencil tool. It even uses the pencil tool uh, uh, color for for its base, but well, it's because it has like a a, a line tool. Uh, it has line tool properties. That's what makes it weird. This one it has like the properties of the line tool. You grab the selection tool real quick. You can see that it's just a line and it's like a skeletal line basically because you have your your stroke that you can do let's see here and so that's my stroke size but it's drawing using lines and uh, let's see here, control my smoothing. And just the same thing as the outline. So with the outlines, it, 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 it behaves like the stroke tool, like the pencil tool, right? But it's generating what looks like it's generating what looks like a a brush tool, but it's not. It's basically a single line with different thickness projection properties added to it. Um, the downside of this is that if you intersect it. Oops, with, with, with another one. You get all sorts of like really weird effects. Now, if you're creating artwork that's to be used uh, in something else, like see how this corner here is really weird, um, that you're going to be using this in Illustrator and Photoshop or in a cartoon animator or some other program, um, this is not a, a very, um, what do you call it? This is not a very um, well supported. Uh, tool. This is like a really unique feature to Adobe Animate. Uh, it's not compatible with a lot of uh, external tools out there. 
So if you wanted to convert this to SVG, this will just come out as like a really like weird single solid line. Uh, this is reminding me of rigging blender models. Those effects might be handy though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that mesh tool, for example, that's like that's like a straight up like, you know, adding bones to a mesh. Um, you can. Uh, let's say you're drawing a hand. Well, this is a great piece of artwork. But I can add that, that pin tool. And now, You know, I can manipulate this. So, the funny thing is, I mean, I know it's a cool little tool and stuff, and you can do all sorts of nice stuff with it. I've never seen anybody actually use that in real life <laughs> for anything like, aside from demonstrating it. So if anybody watching this video actually uses this on the field, let me know. Because it does seem like it could lead to a lot of creative uh, possibilities. I just, I don't know. I, I never used it uh, and I'm, I don't know anybody who, who out there does, um, you know. An animal tail, a character's a basic arm, you know, it's it's definitely something that could be useful. I can see it. A tree swinging in the wind. Stuff like that. Alright, let's see here. We have our, sil our uh, lasso tools. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're coming into towards the end, I guess. Uh, lasso tool, this is the regular lasso tool. Works almost like the pencil tool to make create a selection. And, the, and most uh, programs have something similar to this. Polygonal lasso. Allows you to select stuff by clicking on different parts and whatever is inside of the selection area becomes selected. The uh, zoom tool allows you to select an area and zoom into it. You switch it by holding down the alt, the alt key and it turns it into a zoom out. Let me see. 100. I'm just going to draw a couple boxes real quick. So with the zoom tool, okay. So <clears throat> by clicking on an area, and dragging a box around it, you'll zoom in to that specific area. Now, if I hold down the Alt key, <clears throat> if I drag, it'll zoom in again. But if I just click, it'll zoom out. As long as I'm clicking, it'll zoom out. But if I drag, it'll zoom in. 
all right now this is kind of the same thing as if you're just like holding down the alt the the control key on your keyboard and roll the mouse uh, the mouse wheel in and out so that's that's this pretty much the same effect um let's see the ink bottle tool we already did that that's when you want to change the color of the outlines why did those not change i don't know so ink bottle tool oh that's because i didn't have a different color so there you go um text tool kind of self-explanatory there's different types of text uh dynamic text is if you're writing uh, a game or some kind of um program uh programmatically uh based uh project where you might be making a game or a website well, i guess you're not well you can still make websites you just can't publish them as flash you got to do uh, html5 but uh dynamic text is text that you want to put on your project that you might want to dynamically change into something else later on and for the purposes of cartoon animation you'll probably never use it uh static text is the one that we really concern ourselves with so this is text that will show up on our film um there you go so when we just type it in here okay any text that is selected uses the fill tool for the for the paint bucket for its color properties use the transform tool to adjust it you can do all sorts of like fancy little effects with that duplicate it okay so I mean text is pretty self-explanatory you have of course in the properties panel anything that's selected uh, uh, you you will have uh, different um, properties for it like uh, you know how, how how the spacing is on the letters the point size the color you know the type of text that you have uh, paragraph options this is all very self-explanatory stuff um, let's talk about the stage itself um, the stage is based on a coordinate system so it starts here this is where your zero point is and it just goes it just goes to the right and then from here it goes down um, and from here it goes up and from here it goes to the left so that's one two three four five six etc one two three four five six so and of course these are your negatives so it's negative one negative two negative three negative one negative two negative three so if i draw a box on the stage and i select it it'll tell me that this box is 77 by 77 let's make it an even 50 by 50 so you can, you can manipulate objects just using the properties panel. Uh, it is located at 3.24.5 and 2 and Y 245.5. Now, remember what I said about being on decimal points? Whenever you have an object located at a decimal uh, spot, you run the risk of having that, that object be a little bit blurry. If you want it to be like pixel perfect crisp, you 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 want to have nothing but um, but um, but straight up numbers without decimals. 
Now you can click this button here and say hinting. And even if it is on 224.5 by 245.5, Flash is just gonna automatically tweak it and remove those decimal points so that when the project is rendered, it, uh, it doesn't show that, that slight blurriness and stuff. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna demonstrate um, something. Let's see. I'm going to paint with this color and I'm going to remove this. I'm just gonna draw like some splotches here. And I don't know how well this is gonna show on the video because um, because of the um, compression that takes place. But this object, oh, 594 by 327. Oh, I got snapping turned on. Let's add some artificial decimals so we're, now we're we're not now we're not on a perfect uh, alignment there the controller so when you look at this it's kind of blurry Let's see if I can find it I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna put it in a place where I can find it. Closer to here. I think I pasted it at an even number. I'm gonna make sure that this has decimal points. So when we zoom in, there's this little blurriness to it. And that's because it's not at an even uh, number. Integers, that's right. When, when you're dealing with direct integers. Now, people who work with pixel graphics, uh, this is a custom tool. This is not a standard tool inside of uh, Adobe Animate. Mm. I have a better one somewhere in here. Okay, I have it hidden. This is like my own personal tool. So, I can draw with this tool that basically ensures that I'm drawing directly on pixels and the locations are within the pixels without going outside of the um, of those pixel areas i don't even know what they're called <laughs> it ensures that the that the drawings are straight up integers So I'm kind of cheating because this is not an actual tool that's available to y'all um, as part of the Adobe installation. But for demonstration purposes, we can see that it's nice and crisp, it stays within the lines, right? So for so for those people who like, uh, you know, because I'm not because I am not using uh, decimal points, the stuff is exactly where it needs to be uh, in terms of like 
straight up solid pixels, the artwork is nice and crisp, no matter at what resolution. But with the vector art, if you select it, you select the shape, let's see here, uh, I guess it works better with strokes and stuff. <laughs> and you enable hinting, you'll have the same effect, but it'll be nice and crisp. As long as for that shape, you have hinting enabled. So let's see, what, do, uh, what are we missing that's important in the tools panel? That, I think that covers everything that's important. So, polygonal tool, These are some of the supplemental ones. Nobody uses these. Well, I might be lying. Some people use them. So oval primitive tool. It's kind of a techie type of tool. It allows you to do stuff based on that kind of thing. So there's people who use these type of tools. Uh, in cartooning and stuff, um, there's hardly ever a need for it, but it, it's it's a really nice tool, and you, I mean you can do all sorts of like things for like design work, you know, with it. That's the um, the oval primitive, the polystar tool. It's like you know. It, um, it draws a polygonal shape basically uh, if you go to the properties panel you can modify it for example you can change it into a star you can tell it what how many sides you want the star to have the point size Um, let's see same thing with the polygon you got number of sides you don't have to do just five I guess uh, that's a triangle right <laughs> three sided polygon You go too far, it turns into a circle, basically. Um, 3D rotation tool. I think this one is used in conjunction with... Um, with symbols. Yeah, so we're not getting into symbols too much in this demonstration, but uh, suffice it to say, if you have a symbol, now you can do stuff like this. This is a, a dynamic effect. It's just like code driven. So to create a symbol, you go to modify, symbol, uh, I mean modify convert to symbol and you have movie clips uh, buttons and graphics uh, so movie clips are the most common ones they contain dynamic elements but once it's a, a symbol you can manipulate it using this tool now it, it's basically its own thing because once you start doing that uh, you um, 
you kind of lose it, their ability to interact with your other artwork. But, you know, it could also be a good way for you to create like uh, designs and uh, lay out things for like backgrounds and things like that. I mean, use your own creative judgment. Uh, it can be a nice little tool. Um, the perspective is a little wonky. It's based on this XYZ coordinate way up there. So it's not like a traditional 3D program. It's really weird to get used to it. So most people, I mean, I personally don't know anybody who actually uses this in real life. So, but it's there. And I guess that's one of the reasons why it's just hidden back there because they created it at some point and they, they, you know, they're like, oh, nobody uses it. We'll just, just kind of toss it out back there. The 3D transform tool. This is kind of another, you know, obscure one. So it just kind of allows you to move an object in 3D space, but it's not absolutely clear where the XYZ coordinate is coming from. I think it's based off of this corner up here also. Um, but, you know, anybody watching this video finds a good use for those tools, uh, yeah, definitely let me know. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's see if we have any more obscure ones. These right here, these are all custom tools. I'm not going to go into those. Those are my own personal custom tools. Um, let's see here. But, yeah, you can create your own tools. Uh, using JSFL and uh, Adobe has this thing called the uh, extending flash or extending Adobe animate uh, SDK or API or whatever which you can use as a reference on how to do you create your own tools create your own commands uh, and panels and stuff uh, so yeah it's extendable so if you if you manage to get custom tools from the adobe marketplace or people's websites that they make them available um, you can install them and you'll grab them from here and you just kind of customize your own uh, tools panel based on your own workflow um, let me see here so this tool here the width tool let's see if i can when you draw an outline it's kind of wonky. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I guess that's why they keep it hidden. Let's uh, try making it thicker. It may or may not work with this tool. Let's see here. Okay, go with a bigger stroke size. There it is. So you can adjust <coughs> the stroke. So if you're really, really finicky about the way an outline should look and don't want to use the brush tool, <laughs> I never use this one. It, it just feels very techy to me, but you know, you can customize the way that looks uh, using the properties panel. So let's see here, you have that, you know, we'll put little points on that. So then we can take this and you know you see how that little dot is going um so if i hover over that main dot right there i can adjust that witness up and down i should be able to also like pump it even higher there it is so make it even thicker if i want to put another one right there So it can be a useful tool. I personally prefer not to use it. 
but yeah i mean i can see this being a very useful little tool because ultimately it's a it's still a it's a pencil tool it's a line tool you know it's something that you made with the line tool um <clears throat> let's see here I'm, I'm, I'm holding down the shift key so I can keep my my lines straight look at this artifacting that takes place at the intersection line that's one of the reasons I don't like it personally but you know people get creative you know people are creative you'll find your own ways of doing things and this might be a tool that you end up using definitely a much nicer cleaner looking line and it's unbroken so I can fill that in with a color nice and easily smoothen it out um, so I can come in here and let's say see this whole thing is done with it has two points in it holy crap this entire shape was done and it contains only two points that's super optimized. But I can make this thicker. I can make it thinner. I can come in here and make this side thicker. So yeah, that could be a useful tool when you do export this to a third-party program. Though it's it, that's where that's what that's one of the reasons why I don't use it because I do end up using other programs, um, different formats and stuff. Like if I were to export this as an SVG file, it'll just look like a regular solid line. The, all that all those properties that it takes to interactively to to just kind of generate that look and feel it's only within Adobe Animate. So unless you're gonna export it as video or you keep it within you know, Flash, uh, it's not gonna look like that. So it, it, it can be a little bit of extra work for nothing uh, unless you're gonna to stick to within Flash or you're gonna just render it out uh, just directly to video where these effects will be permanently there, but then you'll lose the resolution independent. That, that just becomes a whole different thing. So uh, your creativity is your own, you know, the tools are there. Uh, we covered the selection tools, the, the eraser, oval, square, line, uh, custom tools, um, pencil, uh, the grab tool, the pen tool, the text tool, the eyedropper, I think we have all our bases covered. Uh, there's a couple things that I didn't cover. Uh, the snapping options. Um, so you have your line. Um, let's see here. Let's switch to our regular. Now, now I'm stuck with that. <laughs> let's go back to this. see trying to get rid of it now there we go so we go back to a regular line um, so when flash uh, detects another object it tries to snap to it that's how that's how it kind of allows us to draw things nice and easy in a way that we can go in and fill them in and all that stuff. But everything that we do is uh, controlled by the properties panel. So if we have the um, uh, <clears throat> this tool turned on, let's see here. Scale, SWF history. 
So here we go, the snapping, this is for the document, it's up here. If I turn it off, Flash doesn't, it's ignoring that right there. And that could lead to a little, uh, it could lead to trouble, like if you're trying to draw solid objects, because you're going to end up leaving little gaps in there. But it still, it still detects the uh, intersections, but it doesn't necessarily need to snap. So I always keep it on unless I do want a gap right there. Sometimes you do want a gap. So uh, being able to turn that on and off, uh, it's, it's kind of a cool little feature and that's in the properties panel. Snap align, that's for alignment of objects uh, against themselves. Uh, the ruler, this ruler here allows you to just kind of measure out things. Um, I can take I can click and hold the ruler at the top and drag it and drag down and it'll drag a little line here so I can put this line if you look on my left side there's like a, a measuring thing from zero all the way down to my you know 1080 I guess that's what uh, 720 because that's the size of my document so if I wanted to put a little outline uh, thing right there at 50 boom I just put it right there and then 720, maybe another 50 up right there. Somewhere in there. I wanted to do that. I can create little guides for how I do things. And uh, so objects, right now it's not snapping. But if I turn this on, Snap a line, I think. Okay, snaps. Uh, you can lock the guides. Um, snap alignment, see like right there, that aligned to that. So when you're designing characters or designing objects, you can use these uh, this this lines as okay. So my eyes are gonna be here, my other eye is gonna be here, or this guy is this high. So when I do the character turnaround, he's still this high. So you can kind of visually measure things uh, to get rid of these lines. Just grab the line and just put it on top of the ruler again, and that'll make them disappear. See, they're, they're not there. So those are all the aspects of the properties panel. Uh, you got options for, you know, frames, which we're not covering the timeline today, but uh, based on which frames you have selected, you'll have frame options, you know. Uh, what type of tween you wanna make, if you're doing animation, creating motion tweens, create shape tweens. Uh, these things and i guess you know uh, as a preview for the video after this one uh if i draw a line because we're gonna be i'm gonna be doing the the, the follow-up video to this is going to be on the timeline so a lot of people, when they think of flash animation, they think of like uh, puppet uh, puppet cutout type of uh, animation, which is kind of the easiest thing to do if you're not very good at drawing or or, 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 or you don't like the uh, the amount of work that goes into frame by frame drawing. So they think of okay, you know, I'm gonna make my symbols sprite based animation, paper cutout type of thing, but if you're doing cell based animation you can clean up your hand drawn animation using straight up outlines and and just you know manipulate the outline from uh, from each frame 
and then do shape tweens and you end up with some beautifully smooth stuff that not i mean even disney has a hard time creating this type of smooth effects and stuff i'm gonna get really deep into this uh in the next video when we when we talk about the uh, the the outlines i mean the the timeline uh let's see here So when people think of flash animation or Adobe Animate uh, based animation, they always think about, you know, uh, just stiff paper cutout looking stuff. They never consider that you can really make some really smooth uh, uh, cell based animation uh, because it is a, a, I mean, at the heart of it, it's a cell based uh, product. So you can manipulate just basic outlines. And do really nice, beautifully smooth animations. So this all comes together. Uh, it's, it's really, I mean, at this point we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. And the next uh, unique video is going to be next month, and we're going to go over the timeline, and we're going to—I'm going to get into advanced animation already because by then you should already know how to work with these tools. Okay, this is all you need. You got the tools panel, you got your properties panel. You should be able to create badass artwork in and of itself without knowing anything else. And from there, we'll just evolve it. We'll use it as as the base. Um, let me see here. So we'll use it as our basis for everything else that we do. So the next uh, big video is going to be on the timeline. And that's when we're going to put together the tools panel with the properties. And we're going to incorporate it across time. We're going to create um, um, symbol based animation. And we're going to I'm going to show you guys how to, how, how to create like Disney quality frame by frame animation within Flash and people think that's very difficult and stuff but once you know all the tricks um, it's very easy I mean you can see here this little shape here look how smooth it moves it, it morphs and stuff you know and by, by just exploiting that alone you can create like some you know Road to El Dorado uh, you know uh, Frozen type of not Frozen wasn't uh, 3D right <laughs> Frozen wasn't 2D, Princess and the Frog type of animation. Um, just with that line effect alone, uh, I'll teach you how to layer it together and just poof, pump it out. So, all right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. I'm not gonna be leaving these videos online. I mean, you tune in, watch them live, interact with me, and you get it for free. But if you miss out, the, the knowledge is gonna be there. Uh, but it won't be for free. You'll have to subscribe to the YouTube channel or get it online from like toontime.com or something.